Well, good evening and welcome to another Wednesday's Word. Uh, we're glad that you're joined in today uh, to be able to hear the Word of the Lord. And uh, praise God for that, that you're hunger for the Word. And we're still in the series, Love in Action, as we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter. Uh, and so if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. Uh, these are the characteristics that we've discussed so far. Love is patient, kind, not jealous, does not brag, is not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly, does not seek its own, is not provoked. Those are the characteristics that we've learned so far. And, uh, you know, the Bible makes it clear that these characteristics are really what true love is, that agape love that we're to have for other people. And as we look at this, study these, we, we learn how to love better. What, what better thing to improve on in life than to learn how to love better? You know, we've been so misled that love is just this feeling. And so if it's just a feeling, then no wonder people don't think they can improve on it. But if love is an action, then obviously it can be improved on. And by studying these characteristics, we can love better. And what better legacy to live than somebody to say of you, they really knew how to love. And how do we know how to love? Well, we have to look at what the Bible says love is, and this is what true love looks like. And so we can love our spouses better. We can love our friends better. We can love other relatives better. We can love our coworkers better. We can love our church members better. It goes on and on. What a great skill this is. You know, we teach all kinds of skills in and, and school, but this usually is not one of them, how to love better. And so let's look at these. Uh, we're in chapter five now. We've been in chapter five a little bit. And so now we're uh, looking at one more characteristic in chapter five. And this one is love does not take into account a wrong suffered. Love does not take into account a wrong suffered. And so this Greek word that describes this in scripture is an accounting word, a bookkeeping word uh, that they would use when they talked about finances. And so when we look at that, we can see that uh, love doesn't keep good records of wrong done to it. People offend us. People hurt us. They hurt our feelings. They may hurt us physically. They may take something from us. Things that just we suffer from what other people do to us. And when we do, we don't need to keep record of that. You say, well, I don't keep record of those things. I've not written a thing down. Yeah, but you write it down up here. Now, in life, you should be a good record keeper of your finances. You know, checks you write, uh, how much money you have in the bank. Uh, all those finances, you need to be a good record keeper. In regard to your health, you should be a good record keeper. You know, my medicines, my lab results, and all those things, it's good to be a good record. Your taxes, you should be able to keep the right uh, information and keep a folder of those kind of records that you'll need for your taxes. But those, you need to be a good record keeper, a good accountant, a, uh, a good business person in that regard. But when regard to offenses, you need to be a lousy record keeper, a lousy accountant, because you just forget it all. You hadn't made a record of it in your mind or on paper or anything. It's just gone away. And that's what it's saying. Don't be a good record keeper. Don't be a good accountant about the wrongs that's done against you. And so as we look at these things, we need to realize that, that that's what true love is. I cannot emphasize enough the importance of this in many years of marriage counseling and sometimes just family counseling of people that are at odds, this is a key issue, a very key issue. I mean, there's people that, that that's why their relationship's not the way it is. That's why their marriage is not the way it is. That's why they hadn't spoken to another relative for years. It's because they haven't truly forgiven and they've kept record of the wrong suffered. You say, well, why is this so hard to do. I mean, if it obviously it was easy, everybody would be doing it. Well, a lot of people have in their mind that if they forgive them or they don't keep a record of it, they've excused their sin. They've said, well, if I forgive it, it's kind of like telling them what you did was okay. No, it's not. No more than when God forgives us 
does he say it's okay? In other words, if you've stolen something and you ask God to forgive you, uh, it's not like God says, okay, I forgive you, so that makes stealing okay. No, he forgives you, but the stealing was, is still wrong. Uh, so he, he doesn't excuse your sin, and we don't excuse somebody else's sin by forgiving them. You say, yeah, but if I forgive them, I'll let them off the hook. Well, first of all, you don't have a hook to put them on because we don't have that right. God's the righteous judge. He's the one that takes vengeance. He's the one that makes things right. That's not for us to do. We just forgive them and, and don't keep a record of that wrong. And so uh, you say, well, they may take advantage of me. Well, that's not the issue either. Just let the Lord handle it. And so uh, we give that to the Lord and that, that helps us to be able to put it in God's hands, the issue. You know, Peter came to Jesus once and asked Jesus uh, a question and and gave Jesus the answer before Jesus was able to answer. Uh, Jesus, uh, Peter asked P Jesus, uh, how many times should we forgive somebody? And then Peter makes this suggestion answer, seven. Well, if you look at tradition back then, the Jewish tradition, the people were spreading, not biblical, just tradition. The tradition was that you needed only forgive somebody for the same offense three times. Again, no scripture backed that up. No scripture says that, but that was just tradition of the day. And so Peter was probably thinking, wow, I doubled that and added one, so Jesus is probably going to commend me for this suggestion. And for him, the idea that I've always thought that he, knowing that that's God's son, has to give Jesus a suggestion of what the right answer is. I mean, well, that's, that's Peter. That's the boldness that he always had, you know, to be able to do that, you know. That suggestive marketing is is nothing that's that goes way back. Goes back to Peter. It, it, think about it today. You know, you go through a drive through and you know you order a hamburger and they say, well, you want a apple turnover with that? You know, and well, you thought, you know, I've never thought about the apple turnover. I was just going to get a hamburger, but now that they mention it, yeah, let's go with that. I guess Peter may have been thinking of suggestive marketing there. I'll just give Jesus the question and I'll give him a suggested answer and maybe he'll go with my answer. But we know he didn't go with Peter's answer of seven. He went with 70 times seven, which basically means there's no limit. And he wasn't saying go up to 490. I think if you go up to 490, you're gonna be able to go to 491 and 10,000 if you can forgive that many times. But the issue Jesus was saying was there's no limit. You have to keep continuing forgiving people of the offenses that they offend you with. And so uh, Jesus followed that up with a parable that we know quite well, you know, about the king who called the man to his court and the man owed him a lot of money. And we won't go into what those figures are, but it was, it was too much to pay back. Uh, we'll just, let's just for simplicity, let's just call it a million dollars. It was a large sum of money that couldn't be repaid. And the man pled, and he pled, you know, because the king was going to throw him into debtor prison, which that's what people had the right to do when people owed them money. And the man pled, and 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 he didn't want to be thrown into debtor prison. And, and so the king had compassion on him and told the man that he forgave the debt. The man owed the king nothing because the king completely forgave the debt. Then the man leaves, obviously happy, and then he goes out and he sees a man in his walk, wherever he was later on, I'm sure that same day, and he sees this man that owed him a small sum of money that could have, could have been easily paid back. And when he didn't, he told the man, he said, I don't have the money right now, give me time. And that amount of money could easily have been paid back. Well, the man that had been forgiven the great debt, debt choked the man and told him to pay him back. And he said he couldn't. So he had him thrown into debtor prison, which he had the right, the legal right to do. Well, the king found out about that. And when the king found out about that, he had the original man that owed him money put into prison. And he basically had him put into prison until he was willing to forgive that man that small debt. In other words, he had the key to the prison cell. But the scripture says that he 
turned him over to the torturers. In other words, not only did he put that man in prison, but he put him in amongst the torturers. Because when you don't forgive others, when you keep the record of wrong, it's like you're living in a mental torture. You're living in prison. But you have, like that man had, the key to get out of the torture, the key to get out of the prison, which was just forgive. As soon as he was willing to forgive that man that debt, those bars would be flung open and he'd be free to go. And Jesus made this statement. He said, my heavenly father will also do the, do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from his heart. Let that offense go. Don't keep a record of it. When you can forgive, you can get it out of your mind and off that record. You see, Ephesians, uh, in Ephesians 4, it talks about to be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, and listen to this, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. You say, I don't know if I've really forgiven them the right way. Well, you've got to forgive them the way that Jesus forgave you. And how did Jesus forgive you? He forgave you completely. He forgave you with his whole heart. He forgave you and didn't keep a record he forgave you and didn't treat you differently because you had committed that offense to God. And that's how we have to do other people. Forgive them fully like Christ forgave us and to not treat them less. In other words, I'll forgive them, but I'm going to treat them bad. That's not forgiveness because when Christ forgave you and me, he didn't have that attitude like, well, I'll forgive them, but I'll treat them less or I won't treat them well. He's a loving and forgiving God and treats us well and treats us obviously better than we deserve. But if we need to forgive others that way, that's how you get it off the record. That's how you get it off the books. That's how you're able to move forward by being able to forgive that way. Romans says, blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. You see, praise God that... God's not keeping a record of ours. Boy, that's good that ours is wiped clean. Our record is wiped clean because of the blood of Christ. And we can show that kind of forgiveness to others by not keeping records of their offense to us. And when you look back at that parable, the way we can be able to do it is to know that that first guy was us. We had so much offense toward God the King I mean, we couldn't, there's just too, our, all of our sins he forgave. We could have never obviously paid for our own sin and he wiped it all clean. He forgave us. And how can we go out and find somebody that's comparatively wronged us less than what we would ever have wronged God and not forgive them? Because it says the king was angry that that man did that. That will make it easier for not keeping records because we say, man, if God can forgive me and wipe it all clean off my record, then I can do that for somebody else. That makes it easier for us to forgive and us to forgive other people of what they've done. I'd like to read this. It uh, came from a, a guy named Martin Marty who retells the story uh, from the I, the, the Needle newsletter. It says, a holy man was engaged uh, in morning meditation under a tree whose roots stretched out over the river bank. During the meditation, he noticed the river was rising and a scorpion caught its root and was about to drown. The man crawled out, or the, the scorpion crawled out on the roots and the man, he reached down to free the scorpion but every time he did, the scorpion would strike back to stinging. An observer came along and said to the holy man, don't you know that's a scorpion? And it's the nature of a scorpion to want to sting? To which the holy man replied, that way may well be, but it is my new nature to save. And must I change my nature because the scorpion does not change its nature. That's so true that even though somebody may not be willing to forgive us and somebody may wrong us, our new nature in Christ is to be able to do for them what they may not be doing for us. 
we've got to forgive no matter what. You say, well, they made me striking back at me when I forgive them. That's irregardless. Our nature, our new nature in Christ is to forgive, to forgive them of the wrong that's done. And we, like that man, can fling over those uh, prison doors and be free at last and be able to walk free because we've forgiven them. But when people hang on, they are in that mental prison. And we can't really truly love somebody if we can't forgive them. Uh, it's impossible. This scripture is clear. Love does not keep account of a wrong suffered. So tear up those mental records and say, you know, I'm going to forgive them from the bottom of my heart. I'm going to let it go because I really do want to love. And I can't love when I keep these records of wrong. I'm not going to excuse it because that's not excusing it. What they did was wrong, but I can forgive it and I can move on from there. And in Christ, we have that victory. Always remember that parable. Can you do it? Yes, you can. Because think about how much Christ forgave you and me. That great price that he paid to forgive us and wipe us all of our sins and we think about how much he did, we can go to that brother or sister that offended us and say, hey, what you did to me was nothing compared to all the things I did to God. It was bad. It was wrong. But God, if he was able to forgive me all that, then in Christ I can forgive you of that wrong done to me. And we can love because that's what love is. Christ demonstrated his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Wow, and even on that cross, saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Yes, that was Jesus, but Christ's spirit that lives within us, if we demonstrate the love of Christ, we also will be good forgivers. Uh, it's been said that, uh, you know, that marriage is really a union. A good marriage is a union between two good forgivers, and that the Christian should be good at two things, giving and forgiving. So let's demonstrate that kind of love to others that wrong us. There's plenty of opportunities to do it because there's plenty of offenses that can occur. Little ones, big ones, medium-sized ones. All the time we can be offended or hurt or wounded uh, or deeply hurt, uh, but it's all the same. We've got to be able to forgive and love that way. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you for forgiving us of all of our sins. And Lord, that we have the power in Christ through the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, that we can forgive others, Lord, and just not keep records of their wrong. Lord, I know even right now there's probably, in the sound of my voice, people that uh, are listening to this, that maybe there's some people that they haven't forgiven. Lord, I just pray they would take that opportunity to do it, whether they need to go see them, they need to call them, Whatever the mode or method is, Lord God, that you would just give them the strength to do it, the words to say, and wh whether that person receives it or not, that they would be obedient to you to make this love action to that other person. So, Father, we look for reports of people that are really forgiving others and see what happens because of it, Father, in their life and in the life of the one they forgive. So, Father, we thank you, Lord, that this action you demonstrated to us all these love actions you were the example for us but truly the way you forgive us lord was such a great example for us to follow to forgive other people so father we thank you we love you we praise you in jesus name amen amen glad you tuned in just a couple of announcements don't forget about the time change uh this saturday night you need to uh, it's, remember it's fall back so set your clocks back uh, one hour, you get that extra hour of sleep. We're not as much concerned about this particular one because if you forget, you'll be early to church. And so that'd be a good thing. So, But we do want to remind you about that, of letting you fall back, set those clocks back one hour. Also, don't forget about Brother Joe's series on Sunday on the end times. It's been great. It's been so enlightening. And uh, just invite others to come. A lot of people are interested in uh, the end times and what's uh, what's happening in our world and that we're living in the end time. So invite others, be part of that great series that he's doing. That'll be such an impact on your life and the life of those that you would invite to come. I love you, praying for you. 
uh, thank you for your prayers of mom. We'll, we'll keep you updated on that. And uh, we thank, I thank God for you and your love for me and uh, my Rebecca and our family. And uh, just we have a loving congregation. And I, I thank God for you and praying for you. God bless.